bit late. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 5 this morning. 2 Kings chapter 5. I, uh, <clears throat> I want to be very careful that you don't hear a sermon today. I, 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 I preach prophetically a lot. But I, I don't need you to hear a sermon today, so I'm I'm not going to take the text normally and read it normally. I want to I, I have a prophecy for this house today. I need you to hear. How many know faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God? I need this church to get faith this morning. How do you get faith? Hearing the word of the Lord. That word word is 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 Rhema. You need to hear the voice of God this morning. Just know that God's using this fat donkey this morning to give it. So don't look at the vessel. Just hear the word. Is that all right? How many of you know God uses whoever he wants to use? He uses donkeys. So don't put the donkey on the pedestal. Just, just, just hear the word of the Lord. Uh, I, I want you to look in 2 Kings chapter 5. And I want to bring the king of, of, of Syria had a great administration. And he had a great warrior whose name was Naaman. He was the commander of his army, and he had done great and mighty things in behalf of the king of Syria. He was a mighty warrior, the Bible said, in verse 1. But the Bible said that he suffered from leprosy. Everybody say he had leprosy. Now, I want you to understand that and, and, and understand the condition of Naaman. And the Bible says that one day, or or excuse me, in verse 2, this is where it begins to start. And at this time, the, uh, the Syrian raiders had invaded the land of Israel. And among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid, a servant. It was a young girl. Everybody say a young girl. And the Bible said that she said to Naaman, You need to go down to Israel, or Samaria, actually, the King James says, and you need to go have the prophet Elisha heal you. I believe that the Lord showed me something in this text, and I'm going to give it to you piece by piece. I believe the Lord said, I'm about to raise up the voice of the youth in this house like never before. I'm about to give the young people, even the children, a voice in this house. I'm going to cause the gift of prophecy to operate in the youth and in the children of this house. And they're going to begin to prophesy and even give directions to mighty people. So I I need you to hear the word of the Lord. When your children start coming home and prophesying, you better listen. When your teenagers that you were just trying to get them to quit smoking weed in their bedroom six months ago come in and begin to prophesy the word of the Lord, you need to listen to them because they're experiencing a transformation that is real. And God is going to raise up young people with a voice that will even give direction to some of us old knuckleheads. Mm -hmm. Are y'all hearing me? This is not a sermon. I'm giving you a prophecy this morning. God's a bit about to raise up. Listen, our, our children are about to experience revival at Relevate Church. I, I need you to hear that. Our children are about to experience revival. And listen to me, if you're a children's leader, I need you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. You need to make you need to understand something. They are no longer going to function by your little your little programs of children's ministry any longer because they're about to break out in a spiritual revival and they are not going to settle with coloring books and they're not going to settle for Bible stories. They are going to go after God with all of their heart and instead of just having normal classes with coloring and building and building popsicle stick houses they're going to be laying prostrate in the floor prophesying and crying in travail
I need every person in this room under the age of 20 years old and those of you that are young adults that are from 20 to 26, I need you to hear the word of the Lord. God's about to use you like you've never been used before. God is about to raise you up with a voice and you're going to come out of timidity and you're going to come out of the realm of worldly influence and you're about to become a spiritual voice in the body of Christ. So you need to go ahead and say yes to the call and the burning fire that you're feeling already in your life because God's already stirring stuff on the inside of you and you're having to make decisions right now. Right now you're making decisions because even in your own family they don't understand the spiritual uprising that is happening in your spirit right now. They don't understand because they're not even, they're, your, your families are not feeling the fire that you're feeling. But I'm telling you, it's time that you got serious about the call of God on your life and the voice of the Lord that is telling you to not settle with where the world is and where the church is, but because God has called you as a voice to help lead the church into the next season that God's taking us. Wow, 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 wow. Number two, that's the first word. Are you ready? So here's the challenge. Naaman's a warrior. Everybody say Naaman's a warrior. But Naaman's hindered because he has leprosy. You need to hear the word of the Lord. Some of you are called to great leadership and you're doing great things for God, but you still have some handicaps in your life. You're carrying some leprosy in your life and you're carrying some things that are preventing you from, from fulfilling the full totality of what God's called you. But listen, sometimes you've just learned to live with leprosy. God is not going to allow you to live with leprosy anymore. God is not going to allow you to live with the hindrances and the weights that have become part of the identity of who you are. God is about to set you free from things that have limited the potential of what God has called you to do. Wow. And the word of the Lord came through a young lady and told Naaman to go to the prophet. Now, Naaman, instead of going to the prophet, understood that he was having to go to a hostile environment. Now watch this. So he goes to the king, who the king trusted him. He was the king of Syria and told the king, watch this. He went to the king, told him what the girl said, said, go down to Samaria and get healed. But he said, I've written a letter to the king of Israel. And the letter of the king of Israel said to the king of Israel, I'm sending my servant, Naaman, and I want you to heal him. But that was not the instruction of the child. God did not tell Naaman to go to the king of Israel and get healed. He told him to go to the prophet Elisha. Uh-oh. But the, but the man's of the letter said, go to the king of Israel. Now here's the challenge. God's going to deliver you and set you free. But you've got to guard who you get your counsel from. You see, the problem is, is you're going to try to go back to an old system to get your counsel and direction from. Listen, because you've been a good leader in times past and you've accomplished God, but God's trying to take you to another level and God's trying to use you on another plane and another place with another position to be more effective than you've been in the past. But when you go back to the old systems of the old king, they're not going to give you the direction because God is not going to do what he did then. Wow. Are you hearing this this morning? I told you I didn't have a sermon. I had a prophecy. And I, I need you to hear me. Some of you are going to go back to the old kings. But the problem is, is you, won't, you did not listen to the young people. You thought you needed to go to somebody who was more mature, who was more developed, who was more established, who had a bigger title and a better position. You didn't trust that 23-year-old young girl that had a checkered past that six months ago they were rebellious and now they're prophesying. Oh, You didn't trust them because they were 13 and came from a dysfunctional family. So you thought, I need to go to somebody who's more seasoned and get direction. Somebody who's more of an established authority on the matter. 
But the problem is the old heads are going to send you back to the old methods. And they're going to send you back to the old patterns. And God said, I'm not operating under a pattern that is not working. I'm not operating under a system that has made the church impotent. God's creating some new wineskins in the body of Christ. And I'm telling you, the old wineskins aren't going to fit anymore. Here's what I say to all of the religious establishments that are out there that are fighting what God is doing. If your systems have worked so good, then why is our country in the shape that it's in right now? Wait a minute. Before you answer it, go ahead and write your false theology and wrong doctrines and misinterpretation of biblical prophecy to justify your impotency. And listen, he didn't come 100 years ago when you were operating under old wineskins that was letting our country get in the shape that it's in right now. So the fact of the matter is is your old wine skins are not working. They are the reason that our churches are in the shape they're in right now. We've operated under the systems of religion that has made impotent the power of God. Wow. Y'all with me? Naaman takes the papers from the king of Syria takes them to the king of of Israel, reads the papers. Watch this. He said, heal my servant, Naaman. The king of Israel looks at it, reads the paper, and said, who does this man think he is? He's toying with me. And he becomes furious. Because here's the problem. When you go to somebody in authority and power that has a position of a power, that has a title of influence, but has no power. And you ask them to do what only God can do. And they realize, I don't have that authority. I don't, I'm the king, but I don't have that power. Oh, my. Watch what happens. They get angry. Everybody shout, they get angry. This is exactly what I was talking about a while ago, that when somebody starts talking to you about the provisions of God and God supernaturally providing for something and you get angry thinking they're only after my money. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me preach today. And you're upset because they're asking you to produce something you don't have the capacity to do. You get angry and offended because the truth is you don't have no power. See, I'm not operating under the financial realms of this world. I'm operating under the financial systems of heaven. And the Bible said, my God owns the earth and the fullness thereof. You need to hear me. God knows how to get the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the righteous. God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. God is not in a depression. God is not in a recession. And God is not under the influence of the bad economy of the Democratic Party. Boy, I hope you just got plumb tore up and mad at me. But my God don't operate under the powers of Washington, D.C. He does not operate under the economy of America. My God operates under the economy of heaven. And my God owns the earth and the fullness thereof. All the gold, all the silver belong to God. And listen, America is not my provider. God is my provider. He goes to the king of Israel and the king of Israel gets infuriated. Everybody said infuriated. Because they asked him to do what he knew he had no ability to do. What God is trying to do in America, we do not have the power in our own abilities to do it. And when you start going to titles and positions to get your miracles, you're going to get disappointed. Oh my God. Because see, right now in the mindset of the church, I'm going to get the bishop to pray for me. In your mind, you got specific people because they carry authority. They have offices. See, this whole thing about you looking for offices and looking for positions and looking for titles, if that's you, let me tell you something. You go ahead and move to the back of the line because God's never going to use you. 
I need to say it one more time. For those of you looking for positions and looking for titles because you think the title's going to give you authority and the title's going to give you anointing, let me tell you something. Nobody's paperwork is going to give you anointing. Nobody's paperwork is going to give you authority. Nobody's paperwork is going to give you the provisions that only God can give you. You need to understand something. It doesn't matter how much man promotes you. Until God anoints you, you are not qualified for this hour. Men have found their political powers of position and titles by kissing behind, by sucking up, by favoritism and politics. Let me tell you something. God will step right over the top of all of the political suck up, all of the political uh, uh, mess and all of the position in the good old boy system and God will reach over and find somebody that learned how to live in the prayer closet that became broken and humble before the Lord and God will raise you up without any paperwork. God will raise you up with any titles. God will raise you up without any position and he will use you. Oh, I need to preach today. This is a season when God's not operating through titles. I'm not saying titles are insignificant. I'm not saying positions in church authority is not important. But I'm telling you right now, thus saith the Lord. If you try to go through the old systems, you're going to be frustrated by going to people that when we talk about healing, we talk about divine provision, when we talk about, listen, and here's the thing, the church has got to come to a place where we're not settling with giving away TVs and cars to get butts in pews. When you've got to have a bring a friend day to grow your church, then you're operating without the power of God. When you've got to have a gimmick and a game to bring people to your church, you have lost the anointing. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm really stirring up every devil in hell this morning. When Oh, I, I, you want me to go away that? When all you got, because listen, you got no living water, so you got to give away bottles of water to show any kind of the... Uh, just get mad at me, I don't care. You spent, you spent... $2,300 getting bottles of water made with your church name on them because you have no living water. Because $2,300 at the water company was cheaper than you getting in a prayer closet and laying down your life so you could come out with the anointing that would heal the sick and open the eyes of the blind and save the lost and set the captives free that I don't need a sideshow and a circus and a clown to put people in my church. I don't need a gimmick or corporate method. I need the anointing. Y'all sure you want the rest of this word? I'm serious. It's not good. Because God's looking for a generation of people, and I pray you are the ones. That God said, listen, I'm not settling for position without power. Titles without anointing. God is looking for a generation of people that says, you know what, this is not all there is. I'll never forget, I lost 100 people in $10,000 a week. Some of you in this room will remember that day. I rode a quip, crippled man in a wheelchair to the front of our church. And I said, I want all you super anointed people that you're so full of God and got all of what you need, come get him out of the wheelchair. I did that, did I not? You remember? I can't remember if you were already in LJ, but I did it. I know Terry will remember it. You heard about it. (laughs) 
I'm trying to give you the word of the Lord this morning. You see, here's the thing. Most of you say, well, I got it. I'm good. I'm anointed. I, I, got, I got the spirit of the Lord. I got the spirit of the Lord. Well, I got a few people in here that I love deeply and compassionately, and they're crippled. Go heal them. Go heal them. If you're so anointed and you've got it all, go heal them. Go get them, because when you go get them out of their crippled state, you pull them out of their wheelchairs. They're coming in here so fast that we will not be able to contain them. We will put them in the fields outside because the world is looking for the real manifestation of the kingdom of God. They are not looking for good sermons and entertaining songs. They are looking for real power that delivers people from demons, that heals broken hearts, that sets people free from the captivity of sin that has held them as slaves. He's looking, listen, people are looking for what Christ and Christ alone can do for them. Because the church has been satisfied with you being a great warrior that's crippled because of leprosy. But Jesus would never leave you a good warrior with leprosy. Jesus is not going to half heal you. And we've settled for less because we chose to go through systems and we put leaders that settled. And when we go to those leaders, here's what they do. They get angry and they debate theology. Oh, my. They make excuses. And they get frustrated and they get mad and they get combative. When they're confronted with the fact that the church is not producing what Jesus said we were supposed to produce. Wow. Oh my. That day I made more people mad because all I did was prove that we didn't have a ministry that was setting drug addicts free. We just had a we just had a revolving door called it a rehab center that wasn't doing nothing but getting men that was getting men by to stay out of jail. But as soon as they got the freedom and the liberty to live on their own, they went right back to the bottles and the drugs and the needles they came out of because we were walking them through steps and we were walking them through programs and nobody got delivered. All I did was pull the cover back on it. That we're running a machine without the anointing. People got infuriatingly angry with me that day. I got called more names that day than I've ever been called in the history of my Christianity. I'll never forget turning around on the platform and telling our worship director, you got performers on the platform. They're performers, but they're not anointed. I told her. That day, a young lady that was singing on the platform met me in the parking lot of the, of the, of the, of the, of the church. And she threw a CD at me and hit me in the chest with it. She said, you were talking about me. I wasn't talking about nobody. I had no person in mind. I just give the word of the Lord. And here's what I want to say. If the shoe fits, wear it. Let me finish this word. It's short. The leadership became angry. But a prophet named Elisha, who had paid the price for the double mantle or the double portion of anointing that he wore. You see, everybody wants it, but nobody wants to pay the price for it. You want somebody to come lay hands on you and, and, and breathe their, their bad preacher breath on you <laughs> along with some mixed spittle. And, Whoo, that's anointed, that's the anointing, that's the anointing. 
you don't get the anointing from somebody laying hands on you. You get the anointing because you walk through hell broken and humble and submitted and surrendered. And instead of getting in the offense closet, you get in the prayer closet. And instead of throwing in the white towel, you press your way through and said, God, I don't care what they did to me. I don't care how bad I'm hurt. God, I'm pressing into you. I'm going after your face. Lord, let your word dictate my behavior. Let your Holy Spirit order my steps and not the opinions of my friend. God, don't let me become a victim. Let me become humble and let me rise out of the ashes of my brokenness filled with the Holy Ghost. You won't be anointing. Die to yourself. Let God sift you until there's nothing left of you. Wow. And then get up in the dust of nothing. Say, God, I trust you. I'm broken. I'm damaged. I failed but I trust you. Get in your prayer closet and learn to pray. When you're in the middle of trouble, the secret place is not a place you go to when all is well. The secret place, if you study it in the scripture, is a place you go to, to when you're under the most intense battles of your life. Make sure you understand when people say the secret place, they're misquoting it. The secret place is not where you go when all's well. The secret place when you go is when all hell's breaking loose. How do you handle your crises? You want to be anointed? How do you handle your crisis? Do you whine and cry, go home and quit? Do you throw in the towel? Do you, do you murmur? Do you, why do you act like the children of Israel? Or do you go into the prayer closet? To the secret place and say, God, it's under your, your wings and I'm hiding it. Because I need you. I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to rehearse it. I don't need to tell people about it that will agree with me. God, I don't need my friend's advice. I need you to influence me because I'm going through it. The enemy's coming in on every side. I'm being attacked. My character's being challenged. God, I need you. How do you handle your attacks? How do you handle your financial crises and your dilemmas at the workplace and your dilemmas with your marriage? How do you handle that stuff? Because how you handle that determines the outcome of your anointing. Oh, wow. If you want to know where the real wine comes from, it comes from the cluster. And there is no wine that can come from the cluster until there's first a crushing. And when you're willing to let God crush you, squeeze you until the true wine of the anointing drips out of your life. And there was an Elisha who had followed Elijah, who carried a mantle on his life, that when he heard about the king becoming angry, he said to the king, he said, send him to me. Send him to me. God's raising up a generation that when the old knotheads couldn't do it, we're going to stand up and say, send them to me. Because I can heal them. Send them to me, I can set him free. Send him to me, I've got the anointing. Send them down here. You can't send them down here. You need to hear me. We need to be the church that says, send them here. We've got the anointing. You said that's boastful, that's proud. No, it's not. Peter said to the crippled man at the gate that everybody in that synagogue had walked by and given him money every day of his life and propped him up and gave him just enough to get him by to keep him crippled. My God. That's where the church has been for the last, I don't know how many years as long as I've been a Christian. Let's just give them what it takes to prop them up and keep them crippled, keep them a beggar, but don't give them what it takes to change their position and let them go where they've never gone before. Y'all ain't hear me. But God said, I'm raising up a generation. I'm raising up some new leaders in the body of Christ that will not settle with crippled people at the gate. We will not give them money when we can say to them, I don't have any silver and gold, but such as I have. Where is the generation that says we have it? We carry the anointing. In our church, the cripple walk, the blind see, the captives are set free. And if it don't happen, we don't write new theologies. We just get in the prayer closet till we have it. We keep praying till it comes. Wow. I need you to hear me. 
if you don't do this, you're going to lose your kids. If you don't do this, we're going to lose this generation. If you don't do this, our country is headed to hell in a handbasket. If you don't do it, the moral decline is only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. He goes to the prophet's house. And he gets there. And God tells him, or excuse me, the prophet tells him. First of all, the prophet don't come out of the house. Everybody say the prophet don't come out of the house. Elisha, verse 10 says, he sent his messenger. Everybody say he sent his messenger. He said, go, to say to, go say to him, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. Now here's what the Lord told me. He said, tell my people to quit determining in their own hearts and their own minds how they think I should answer their prayers. When the prophet did not come out and do what? Naaman thought that he should do. Because the Bible said he got infuriatingly mad. Everybody say he got mad. He said, I'm out of here. I'm not going to go do that. He's a nutcase. I thought at least he should have come out and talked with me personally. Waved his hand over me and called upon the name of his God. But he didn't. He said, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan. Can I tell you that there's one thing that the water in the revival has shown me. That there's a bunch of dummies in the body of Christ that has limited God to how he could move. Because God moved outside of a way that they thought he should move and he moved in a baptistry instead of an altar, they had gotten plumb beside themselves and refused to receive miracles from God because they said, this is not biblical. God won't do it this way. Well, you better be glad that God is not doing it a biblical way because God will spit in your mouth with his own spit and heal your dumbness. You want it biblical? Come here and let me spit in your mouth. See, see, you just got mad. That's what Jesus did. He spit on a man's tongue and healed his dumb tongue. Can you imagine if we have a spitting revival? Well, I just don't believe God moves in that water. And Naaman didn't believe that God told him to go dip seven times in the river Jordan. He said, do we not have better rivers in, in, in Syria? Don't we have better waters? That's a nasty river. I ain't going and dipping myself in that water. He's out of his mind. He, I, he was supposed to lay hands on me. He was supposed to pray over me. And he didn't even come out and talk to me. And he got mad and he left. Everybody say left. Every great move of God. Y'all really don't want me to go here. Whether it was a Catherine Kuhlman, a Jonathan Edwards, it doesn't matter. Every one of them, Charles Finney, every one of them had something that was unique. And was different. Charles Finney invented what most people call the altar of the morning bitch. The altar call. Uh-oh, y'all just got quiet. And did you know that much of the evangelical world fought what Charles Finney did? He led revival that transformed America. Are you with me? Who, who went into the worst places in the whole United States of America and brought flaming revival. 
and the old heads and the old kingship and the old authority said, I don't believe in having an altar call and a morning bench. They called it the decision chair, I think. And they ridiculed him. They wrote articles and they fought him. Because God used some method different than they thought. I wonder how many of you, us in this room have locked God into a method. It has to be this way. He has to meet the need this way. He has to bring provision this way. He has to heal this way. The church has to operate exactly this way. And God said, what he's fixing to do, there's going to be so many diverse ways that God brings miracles into people's lives. And if we start trying to limit how God will move because of the way he moved in somebody else or some other place. If God wants to move in the waters of Dawsonville, then move in the waters of Dawsonville. God, I don't care how you're going to move in Ranger. All I care about is God do what you do. You can do it on top of the building. You can do it outside in the grass. I don't care. You can do it through a donkey. But God do what you do. My goodness. When the king of Israel, I'm done. When the king, I got this one word. Then I got to test the ball, the praise team. Go ahead and come. Guys, if you're worried about the time, I'm just going to tell you something. You just may be the stickler that's stopping revival here. Because when God starts moving, he ain't moving on your time schedule. So quit trying to put him on a time clock. If you if you're gonna limit me to if you're gonna limit me to two hours an hour and a half and you're just gonna get wore out you gonna watch a two and a half hour perverted cussing movie full of worldly murders and killings and anger and you pay twenty five bucks to go see it and then pay nineteen dollars for some popcorn and a coke and then you gonna gripe because you've been in church for two hours my God I hope you get saved before you leave today. I love you but I feel that spirit I'm not preaching to people I am talking to that spirit today. Naaman was sent by the king of Syria with a bunch of silver, a bunch of gold, and a bunch of clothes to give to the one who healed him. Are y'all with me? When the prophet heals Naaman, Naaman says, let me give you a gift. And Elisha said, absolutely not. Because what I have is not for sale. And God said, I'm raising up a generation of people that are not after the anointing for money. Because there's been a generation that has prostituted the gifts and the anointing of God and they have used it for money. And God said, I'm raising up a generation that will forbid you to give them anything for the gift of God that they give to you. Y'all didn't, didn't hear that. I got a word for every one of you preachers that are traveling. If you know if you're watching this, you better listen to me. You better rip up your contracts and you better throw your demands in the garbage can because God is never going to use you to the potential that God's going to use you because you're nothing but a whore and you're prostituting the gifts and the call of God in your life. You better look to God to trust Him for your provision. And listen, if the churches is the churches cheat you out of an offering and they don't take care of you, that's between them and God. But God sent you to do this thing free of charge, and God will be your provider and God will meet your needs and God will supply the resources that you need. Start trusting God and stop trusting your contract. If 
you're in this thing for the money, get out now. If you're in it for, for what people are going to give you because you're needing it, let me tell you something. Sometimes you're receiving of, the, of, of stuff is not necessarily you receiving money from people. Some of you need something more than you need money. And until you get delivered from that, God can't use you. You need affirmation and you need praise and you need accolades and you need attaboys. If you don't get over needing something from the people that you give what God gave you to, God can't use you. Boy, y'all ain't hearing me preach today. I don't need you to give me nothing back. I don't need you to appreciate me. you got to learn how to live in the shadows and not in the spotlight. And if you need people to praise you, then God can't use you. Because when people do applaud you, you're going to run to the spotlight and to the realm of celebrity Christianity. And you're going to wreck what God's going to do in your life. God's had enough celebrity ministers. Boy, y'all are not hearing the word of the Lord today. I'm telling you. Listen, because if you need the praises of people, you're not ready for God to use you. God needs prophets and people that are anointed that said, I don't want nothing you got. I don't need you to appreciate me. I don't need you to applaud me. I don't need the phone calls. I don't need the appreciations. I'm good with nothing. I ain't taking nothing from you. Just go. And here's what he said. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, I need something else from you. You healed me, but I need something else. I need two shovel loads of the dirt from this place. I don't want no money. Listen, I, I don't need anything. You, I, you give me my healing, but I need two dirt loads of this. Because I'm not going back. I'm not going back to Syria unless I take some of this with me. And when you'll become that generation of people that'll come out of the old wineskins and come out of the old paradigm of the dead religious system and you'll become the people that trust in the word of the Lord and you'll get into prayer calls and you'll become the people that God can use that you walk in confidence of the gifts and the call and the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And you have become the people that said, we'll not settle for standard ordinary church anymore. Can I tell you, I need, I need a people that said, I will not settle for going through the religious routine of another dead church service. I will become the person that gets in my prayer closet at home and I bring the river with me. I bring the glory with me because I prayed it much in my home as I prayed when I got to the church building that I didn't need the church to work me up. I came in the door with a busting river with undammed rivers of living water flowing out of my belly. Ah. And God said, they'll come from the nations. They'll come from all over. And all they're going to want is two, two shovelfuls of the dirt. You need to hear the word of the Lord. They're coming here to carry back the ground, back to where they live. They're coming here to receive an anointing. They're coming here to receive a message. They're coming here to receive and catch something from God. And they're going to say, I'm going to take this back home. I need some dirt from Ranger, Georgia. I need some of the stuff that's happening in Ranger. And I'm going to take this back to Syria. And I'm going to take it back. I'm going to take it back to Alabama. And I'm going to take it back to California. And I'm going to take it back to North Carolina. And I'm going to take it back to Maine. I'm going to come get some of that dirt. That Come in church, but it's not just going to happen. They're coming and they're wanting some dirt. They want some dirt, Mom. People are hungry for what's real. 
They're hungry for something that's real. Not something that's, that's systematic, that's dead, that's, that's leaving them with leprosy. They're looking for something that changes their life and brings them into the full potential of who they are. That takes them, that takes them past just being a great warrior. I want you to stand with me all over the building. People ask me all the time, Mom, what changed in your life? When did that change happen where you went from a man who was hungry after God, carried the anointing of God? Where'd you get caught up in religion that led you down that path that I talk about all the time? People ask me that question all the time. And I'm about to tell you something that I just now figured out, James. While I've been delivering this prophetic word, the Lord really showed me the turning point in my life. I never knew the turning point in my life, Chris. You've heard my story all through Lionsgate. There came a turning point in my life when I turned and I became fearful of men. There came a turning point in my life that subconsciously I operated and served the system and the vision more than I served and honored the will and the heart of God. There come a point that somewhere I began to change a little bit, Mom. And I lost something in my life that, that it took me leaving that ministry and dying for five years to finally get back to where I was. And I just now realized where I lost it and where I changed. The pivotal moment in my life was that D-Day sermon. I knew I was on an eight-hour, ten-hour flight from Atlanta to somewhere in Europe. And I was reading a book called A Heart Ablaze by John Bevere. I was on my way to lay the foundation for a crusade of over 30,000 people in a city called Ashama. And the Lord showed me while I was on that flight. Matter of fact, I take that back. I was on my way to lay the foundation for the first crusade of 15,000 people that we would do. That was in Teshi Nungwa. I had not even been to Africa yet. And I was reading that book and I realized our church has lost the anointing. We had a great church. We were running close to 1,000 people. We were thriving. It was full we had $30,000 a week offerings. It was busting at the seams. We're planning churches. Everything's operating great. Everything's wonderful. It was great. Everybody thought this is the greatest church in America, but it had no anointing. We had lost the presence of God. We had good services, good singing, but the anointing was gone. And I knew it was gone. And I wept all the way to Africa reading that book, A Heart of Blaze. And I got to Africa. And the Spirit of the Lord sat down in a little bitty church that had open rafters and dirt floors and I remember falling on the red soil of Africa's dirt and I wept until there was a puddle of mud underneath my eyes. And I remember weeping saying, God, I've lost something. I've lost it. I lost what I have today. What we have in this church. What's happening over these last six, eight weeks in this, in this place. I had lost that. We had probably the best choir and praise team I'd ever had in the history of being a pastor. But that's all we had was good talent. We had programs. They, they were busting at the seams. We had two rehab centers. They were all doing blah, 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 blah. And it wasn't nothing but a rotating doors of no change. People were coming to the altars packing out and nobody being changed. It's exactly what I taught right here today. They were warriors, but they still had leprosy. If 
That's where it was. And everybody believed that day that I singularly, handedly destroyed what was a thriving ministry. No, I didn't, James. I did exactly what God told me to do that day. And I obeyed the Holy Ghost, and the results of it was it thinned the crowds. And when it thinned the crowds, it thinned the money, and it scared the daylights out of me. And I became a coward. I became nothing more than why the Bible said that the fearful will burn in hell. Because people that are afraid of men will die and go to hell. Because you were more afraid of men than you were God. And you, you succumb to the big bucks. You become to old, 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 old Bobby Big Bucks. And you gave in to him because if you, if you buck the little coin, he's going to leave and take his money and run down the road. And you gave, in to, you gave in to old Deep Pockets Bill. Yeah, I know. Because you love men. And you love your buildings. And you love your budgets more than you love God. Because God wants people to be completely delivered. He wants people with the anointing. He don't want a preacher with the anointing. He wants a church with the anointing. He doesn't want a bishop with the, with the power to heal. He wants a church with the power to heal. He wants the no names and the nobodies and the no places to be able to do what he did so that when it gets done, he gets all the glory. Y'all wait, why are you keeping me here so long, Bishop? Because God's still speaking right now. And I want you to know that day something shifted internally inside of me and I never knew it till this day. And I repent publicly. That that day those people that left and that money that walked out the door scared me so bad, James. It rocked my world and so many people thought I was an idiot and a fool that day. The truth is, it was with that moment that I obeyed God and my obedience to God cost me more than I was willing to pay. And something internally shifted inside of me and I didn't even know it till today. God, forgive me. Thank you, Father, that you brought me back to being that man again today. That I was that day that I preached that sermon. Thank you, God. That you gave me a life and a strength and a courage and a boldness by your grace. That I am not afraid of people and I'm not afraid of money. Thank you, God, that I'll preach the truth to the people of God. That will challenge you to step up to the plate. Challenge you to be what he created you to become. And I'll do it without an apology. And I'll do it without a fear of who will be here next week or won't be here next week. I need you to look at me today, church. God's called you to carry this thing. He's called you to lead this thing. Young people, look at me. You are the voice coming in the days, immediate days. Not, not days to come, in the immediate days. You are a voice in this generation. Montana, you are a voice in this generation. You have a voice that will awaken people like Naaman, to come out of not just being a good warrior, but to be healed of their leprosy and come into the full potential of who God will call them to be. It's always been on your life. That's why hell fought you so hard. You'll carry the fire of God. You listen to me. You'll carry the fire of God. You hear me? Your past is tainted with things, and you need to understand you're carrying a new fire. You hear me? You're carrying a new fire. And this fire is going to ignite the body of Christ. And you be as bold as a lion and don't you be intimidated by the old heads that want to confine you because of the past and because of your youthfulness and because you're a female. God said you're a voice in this nation to this generation. Father, in Jesus' name, may the fire of God burn in her life. Ah. I want every person in this room under the age of 25 and under to get up here to this altar right now. Come on. Every person in this room, 25 and under, come. I need you to come.